Castlevania Circle of the Moon, or just Castlevania in the UK. I had the pleasure of picking up this game when I first got that console. I had no idea what a Metroidvania genre was, and I dove head first. But what I would find is a franchise that was split into two. The late 90s was a tumultuous time for the Castlevania franchise. The series had somewhat become repetitive with each entry, and with the industry eagerly shifting towards 3D experiences, it essentially split the franchise into two distinct styles. You had the more traditional linear level approach of the 3D games, such as Castlevania 64, and then you had an evolution of the 2D experience with games such as Symphony of the Night, which is the much more successful and critically acclaimed game and a style that Castlevania would mostly adopt from this point on. Linear levels have been replaced by a large open map with areas you will have to backtrack to in order to progress. Some areas would be inaccessible because you lacked a certain ability or item to get through, a wide variety of enemies, RPG mechanics had been added, strength and defense would be determined by your level and selected equipment. To put it briefly, the entire 2D genre would be redefined by this one game, Symphony of the Night. Now when it comes to a Castlevania entry on the GBA, the 2D Metroidvania approach was the most obvious way to take advantage of the technology, and Konami took advantage of everything they had. Before you even start the adventure, you're presented with a piece of music that demonstrates exactly what the GBA could do. A haunting choir that sounded so good, it even fooled my family into thinking that there was someone singing outside the front of the house. Taking place in 1830, Circle of the Moon is set in one of the fictional universes of the Castlevania series. The premise of the original series is the eternal conflict between vampire hunters of the Belmont clan and the immortal vampire Dracula. Circle of the Moon's protagonist, however, is Nathan Graves, whose parents died a decade ago to banish Dracula. Morris Baldwin, Nathan's mentor, whom helped in the previous battle with Dracula, ultimately chose Nathan as the successor to the Hunter's Whip, much to the dismay of Morris's own son, Hugh. Meanwhile, at an old castle, Camilla, a minion of Dracula, seeks to revive him, only to be interrupted by the arrival of Morris, Nathan and Hugh. But it's too late, Dracula has been revived. Dracula destroys the floor under Nathan and Hugh, causing them to plummet down into the catacombs. Surviving the fall and wishing to find his father, Hugh leaves Nathan behind, as Nathan proceeds to search the castle for his mentor. Along the way, he learns that at the next full moon, Morris's soul will be used to return Dracula to full power. The one thing that sets this game apart is a magic system called the Dual Setup System, or simply DSS. This involves pairing magical cards in order to create a unique effect. There are two types of cards, action cards which determine the type of effect, and attribute cards which determine the element. There are 10 types of each, giving you 100 different abilities, although many of them are just copy and paste, but with a different element. Some can boost your strength, boost your defense, others modify your weapons, transforming your hunter's whip into a fire whip, a whip of thorns, rapid striking punches, and others are much more traditional type of magic spells. The music is a traditional Castlevania score, thumping energetic tracks with a gothic twist, original and remixed tracks from previous games, with the duty of composing given to Sotaro Tojima and Hiroshi Mitsuoka, two veterans of Konami and the video game industry as a whole. But the audio isn't the only thing that's good about this game. Everything kicks ass in this game. The visuals might be slightly simplistic by today's standards, but back then, every pixel oozed with life. The variety of environments could easily have been too different, but because they all have an underlying gothic theme, they weave in and out of each other flawlessly, and make the castle seem like a fully realized, fully lived in world that had a huge cast of denizens that resided within it. Even though there are a huge variety of beasts and ghouls, after halfway through the game, you'll start to notice that the majority of them have just been palette swapped and given better stats. Eventually, you'll notice that most corridors and most rooms are filled with just 
two to three different enemy types. It's nothing too drastic, but you will start to notice the limitations of the GBA cartridge, leading to a feeling of repetitiveness. All the praise in the world, as much as I'd like to give it, can't hide some of its most glaring flaws. One in particular is quickly rectified within the first five minutes of gameplay though. The ability to run is acquired. Yes, you heard that right. Just to run, you have to walk through the first section of the game and collect an upgrade. Sure, double jumping and flying through the air is not something you can do naturally, but running? The controls are simplistic, but tight enough never to be a problem, even though the Medusa heads are still a pain in the ass. God, they really are the worst enemies in this series. Progression through the castle is really up to the player. The game never holds your hand and you can tackle the game in any way you want. There's certain areas that you can't gain access to because you haven't got the correct ability, but once you have the basics, there's no stopping you. You can even bypass a couple upgrades without even knowing. The underground waterway is an area that's filled with poisonous water. With neither the rock wing or cleansing relic, you will die very easily, but it is possible to get through it. If you just stay on the corner ledges, you won't get poisoned. You just need lots and lots and lots of potions. The drops for potions is pretty rare, and this being one of the only two ways you can heal in between save points can get quite annoying. The other option is to acquire the correct DSS cards that allow you to heal when you stand still. In a boss fight, this is basically impossible. The main way you can stockpile potions is to farm. Luckily, the farming and grinding is never too frustrating. None of the items are too difficult to get, and none of the bosses require that much grinding before you can beat them. It's a perfect pick up and play style game that never feels frustrating. The only annoyance that I have about this game is that when I was younger, it took me weeks to complete. But now, I can do it in a single sitting. A, a very long one, but a single one nonetheless. When you complete it, you'll be rewarded with some completion bonuses. Remember those? Merely enter the following names on starting a new game, and you can play through it with extra bonuses. All of the DSS cards, heightened stats. So if you want more bang for your buck, then here you go. Overall, it's a fantastic game that launched a whole series of entries on handheld consoles, but it does start to show its limitations due to that tiny, tiny Game Boy Advance cartridge. Now, the gameplay is amazing, the story is simplistic, but it's never too dumb to make the gameplay suffer. As a childhood favourite of mine, I'm going to be slightly biased. Bye.